I sure am glad that we, we can still worship. Worship is not about one person. It's about who we're worshiping. Amen? Real quick, I want to I want to sh- say a couple things to you. Um, we do we do have uh, some buckets set up on the pallets out there. If you if you have uh, anything that you can help donate to keep things going, uh, obviously things are tough for everybody. If you don't have anything, fine, no problem. If you do, or you can give online, and uh, we we certainly appreciate whatever you can do. We want to continue to reach out to this community, whatever it takes t- to do that. We want to do it, and. Uh, it's a tough time right now. A lot of you are, are struggling. A lot of you are struggling financially. Uh, you're very uncertain. Everybody's uncertain. I don't know anybody that knows really what's going on or what's going to happen. Anybody that says they know what's going to happen in the next few weeks, I think they're just lying. They don't know. But I do know one person that knows what's going on and what's going to happen in the next few weeks, and that's God. He's not He's not up to scratching his head right now. He's not going, I don't know where this came from or what's going on. He knows exactly what's going on and what's coming. And as I've said in the past, I believe God is using this time right now to get our attention. He's using this time to get the world's attention and to be reaching out to people saying, I am here. The one that you've turned against, the one that you've rebelled against, the one that you've denied for years, I am here and I love you so much I'll do whatever it takes to get you to come to me. And I just believe, and a lot of people say, I just don't believe God can be that kind of a God. Then what you're doing at that time is you're creating an idol. You're creating a God in your own image that you want Him to be like, but He's not like us. God's love is not like us, and he would, He's willing to do anything to get the, the attention of His people. Today, real quick, I'm going to share with you a real quick uh, message, and it's called, Two Questions to Change Everything. Two questions that can change everything in your life, in my life. I hope that uh, some of you are able to watch online today. We're we're live streaming on Facebook today. We're going to have to use our website and Facebook and Instagram and all those things to try to connect with people as much as possible. If you are a small group leader, I encourage you to reach out to those that have been in your small group on Wednesday nights and in your home groups uh, by social media, Zoom, or, or whatever it takes to do that. Stay in contact with people. And what I'm planning on doing, and and some of our other pastors are going to contribute as well, we're trying to work out the details, is have a time at least three days a week, if not every day at a certain time, where we'll be on Facebook Live and you can can get on there and and talk to us, write in uh, questions that you may have or possibly prayer requests, and and we're just going to pray for you right there and then. And, And we'll give you that information as soon as we get a schedule worked out, but I'm going to start doing that this week, and we'll, we'll keep you up to date on that. You know, everybody's got a story to tell. you got a story to tell. Everybody has a story to tell. We can just go around the block. Everybody has a story to tell. And it seems like the older you get, the shorter your story gets. Have you ever noticed that? It's because we have so much time in our lives, but we leave out a lot of parts in our lives. Typically, if somebody says, tell me about yourself, you would say, well, I was born in this place, I grew up here, you know, I went to high school here, went to college, I did this for a job, had some kids, grandkids, and now here I am. You could basically tell your life story in about two minutes, can't you? But in between that time, there are a lot of things that we leave out. There are a lot of things that we, we don't want to tell that's a part of our story, but it's still a part of our story. A few weeks ago on a Wednesday night, I asked our small groups in the adult area, I said, uh, I want you guys to answer this question. What should the church be known for? What should the church be known for? And they gave me a list of some things, and I'll tell you some of those things in just a minute. But I have a question for you that's better than that. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be known for? And this is for everybody. This is for the kids. This is for adults. This is for everybody. And I'm not talking about when you die, your legacy, and people say, you know, when Mark died, we could say this. But I'm saying right now, what do you want to be known for? Everybody's got a story to tell. In Genesis 39, we all know the story of Joseph. He was sold by his brothers who hated him into slavery. He ended up in the house of Potiphar who was an Egyptian official. And in, I'm not going to read all this to you, but in, in chapter 39, verse 6 through verse 20, it talks about how Joseph got favor and, and that Potiphar put him in charge 
of everything in his household. And Potiphar had a wife that came to him. It says in verse chapter 6, it talks about this. It says Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. I think this was not the first time she had done this. And I'll tell you why in a minute. I think she had done it many times before. But here's what Joseph said. He said, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, has he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. Joseph said, I can do anything I want. And he, my master has given me freedom with everything except you because you're his wife. In other words, you have a story to tell, lady. When you tell your story, is this going to be part of it? And he says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God. The Scripture goes on to say that day after day she, she pursued Joseph. Finally, there came a day when he was alone in the room with her and she grabbed him and he ran out but left his cloak behind. And then she started screaming and accusing, accusing Joseph of raping her, which he didn't do. And here the Scripture talks about, uh, and I can't remember the verse, but in the same set of verses, verse 20 I think it is, or about 18, it says, she kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us has came to me to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. This is why I believe that she had done this before. He had the, the absolute right and should have probably put Joseph to death on the spot for doing that to his wife. He could have had him killed, executed immediately. Why would he not do it? I believe that she had done that before. He had heard this story before. But instead, he put Joseph in prison. And you probably know the rest of the story. Joseph got lots of favor in prison as well. So a few weeks ago when I asked the church, what should the church be known for? And not just Living Word Church, but what should the church be known for? And here are some of the answers that, that you guys gave me. Love, charity, guidance, fun, active faith, to live like Christ, to love one another, to know the Word of God and speak it in love. We forgive. To reach out to the community. To be accepting of all. Spiritually sick people should feel welcome at church. That's the truth, isn't it? This is, this is not some place for us to be elite. This is a hospital for hurting people. It's what it should be. Now, now today we have an outdoor hospital. That's okay. You know, many, many years ago, over 2,000 years ago, Peter said something to Jesus when Jesus was asking, who do people say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, that statement is true and, the, and no matter what happens, the church will never fall. The gates of hell will come against it. But the church will never fall. And here we stand over 2,000 years later, not in a building, but we're still the church. Amen? It has nothing to do with the building. So that statement was true. Here's a few more things. It said, uh, where you go to meet God, we should be known for humbleness, to be relevant, real, authentic, and generous. You know, last night our, uh, our daughter sent us a video uh, she had posted it on Facebook. They have a, they're in Dahlonega. They have a church over there, and they did a drive-in church at the Lumpkin County High School. She sent us this little short video of our granddaughter. Her granddaughter and grandson were in the back of the car. They had they had uh, been playing in the back of the car, and the, they had their worship team out, and they were worshiping. Suddenly, Leighton, our little granddaughter, stopped playing, went and got in her car seat, closed her eyes, and just started worshiping. It was precious. That's authentic. That's authentic worship, man. When you don't care who's watching or where you are and nobody else is around, but you're worshiping God with all your heart, that's authentic. That's what I want this church to be about. I want us to be authentic and real, even in the midst of these hard times. I know we're struggling. I know people are scared. I know people are worried. But we've got to understand something, y'all. I know it sounds cliche, but God is still on the throne. He always will be, and He is not surprised by this. And He's going to take care of it. But we got to be about His business. So here's my question for you. What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be honest with yourself? What do you want to be known for? 
in your business, your occupation, in your family, what do you want to be known for? As a father, as a husband, what do you want to be known for? As a wife, as a mother, what do you want to be known for? As a Christian, what do you want to be known for? Now. Not someday. Not when you die, after you die. What do you want to be known for now? When people talk about you, what do you want people to say about you without having to lie? Here's the second question, which is a lot harder. First is, what do you want to be known for? The second question is a lot tougher. What are you known for? What are you known for? I know you want to be known. I want to be known for something. I want to be known as a godly man, as a, as a good husband, as a good father and grandfather, and, and somebody that loves people and puts people above myself and all kinds of different things. I, I, I want all kinds of things to be said about me. But then what, what am I known for? What are you known for? And, and for all of us, there's a gap. There's a gap between what we want to be known for and what we are known for. And maybe it's a, a big gap. But maybe it's a small gap, but I guarantee for every one of us, for our businesses, for every organization, there's a gap between what we want to be known for and what we actually are known for. Now that doesn't mean that you just say, well, you know, there's nothing I can do. Just throw up your hands. You know, I can't. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's asking you to be perfect. I'm asking you to ask some hard questions of yourself, and your business, and, and, and what people think of you and what God thinks of you. There is a gap for every one of you. But here's the, here's the real question. What can you do? What can you do? You. What can you do to shrink the gap? What can you do to shrink the gap between what you want to be known for and what you are known for? And when we think about the church, so let's talk about the church for a minute. I'll let you guys off the hot seat for a minute. Let's talk about the church. There's a gap in our church, what we are known for and what we want to be known for. I'm not foolish enough to think that we're doing everything perfectly. There's not. There are people today that are going to criticize us and be negative and, and even just be just attack us for having this, this service, this drive-in service. I understand that. And I don't know what will happen next week. We may not have one. We may. I just don't know. Nobody knows. But there's a gap between what we want to be known for and what we are known for. So as a church... In Acts chapter 2, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. We should be known for that. It says all the believers were together and had everything in common. Now, we can't all be together now. We had to stay six feet apart. But we can still be together in spirit. We can still thank God for technology. We can stay together by our cell phones and by technology. And we can still reach out to people. It says they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. There are people, listen, that you know. You can't expect the church to take care of everything. There are people that you know that are in need. And God may have placed you in their path, in their life, to help meet that need. That's what the church should be about. And then it says that they, they ate together and with glad, sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That God gave them favor with people as they were serving those who had need. And then it says, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. It goes on to say, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them and all that there were, there were no needy persons among them. That sometimes they came and they brought money where they had sold land or property and they gave it to the church. Listen, I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not asking you to sell your property and bring money to the church. But they were so trustworthy. That church was so trustworthy that people were willing to sell their property and their possessions and bring the money to the church so the church could distribute it to people that had need. And it says that no one was needy. Doesn't that sound like a pretty awesome church? Doesn't that sound like something you would like to be a part of? And that means that we have to act with complete integrity, completely open and honest and trustworthiness. But you have something that you can do to shrink the, shrink the gap in the church as well. But let me go back to you for a minute. In your life, ask yourself this question, honestly. Please don't just listen to this and go, well, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go to lunch. What can you do to shrink the gap in your life between what you want to be known for and what you are known for? What can you do in your business, the organization you're a part of, and in the church as well, but in your life? 
See, I believe that this, this time in history that we're going through right now is huge. People say it over and over again. The president says it all the time. We've never ever seen a time like this. None of, none of us, from the, the oldest person here, has ever seen a time like this. This is going to be spoken of for history from now on. From the youngest, the youngest child here has, has great grandchildren. They're going to be talking about the time when the coronavirus hit the United States and how many people died and what happened. And it's going to be spoken of in history. How do you want your part to be told? When history is talked about in this time, in 2020, COVID-19, churches are shut down, businesses are shut down, people are staying in their homes, they're afraid, people are dying getting sick. I don't think the coronavirus is going to kill me. I think it's the pollen that's going to kill me, actually. I know y'all are all laughing. I can't hear you laughing, but I think you're laughing. How do you want your part to be told? Your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors, their kids are watching you to see how you handle this. As a Christian, they're watching they may not be saying anything, but I guarantee you, they're watching. How are you handling this? Are you handling it with faith? When we talk about how our faith is in God, is that really how you're being known? Or is your fear taking over your faith? And I'm not saying be stupid. I'm not saying don't be concerned. I'm not saying don't wash your hands. I've got Lysol wipes and, and antimicrobial spray up here. I mean, I'm not saying be stupid. I'm not saying expose yourself to a sickness. But how will your part be spoken about in history? The sad part is for some of you, maybe none of you that are here, maybe some that are watching online, I don't know. Some of you are going to say, you know what? I really don't care what they say. I don't care what they say about me. Because that's about me. I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to take care of myself. And, I, and you know, I hate it for everybody else, but I'm not, I'm not going to do anything for anybody else. I just want to say this to you. In love. Your life is too small a thing to just live for yourself. Your life is too small a thing to just live for yourself. You've got to live for something bigger. God has placed you here in this time, in history. God's put you here for such a time as this. Your life is so much more than what you're living if you're just living for yourself. You've got to live for something bigger. And that's the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we have that when we die, whether it's from the coronavirus or a car wreck going home or 50 or 60 or 70 years from now from, from just a old age or whatever, that our life is going to mean something more than just living it for ourselves. You've got to live it for something bigger than just that. God is an awesome God, isn't He? Here's, here's, how, I want to, here's how I want to close. In the end... Nothing is going to matter. I know you know that. But I'm telling you in the end, nothing is really going to matter but what we do for God. And someday we are going to pass from this earth. And we're going to join millions and millions of other followers of Christ singing praises to our God. We're going to sing praise God, hallelujah, over and over again and over again. And that's how I want to close if you want to join me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Lord, you do reign. There's no one like you. Father, I thank you that we have had the opportunity to gather together. Many of us have missed it so much just being together as the church. And, and while we're not able to hug, we're not able to shake hands, we're, we're not even able to get close enough really to speak. God, we are bound by one thing, that's your spirit. Your blood that was shed for us. Lord, I praise you for allowing us to have, live in this time. It seems like a hard time. But God, it's also a great opportunity to share with those that need to hear of the hope that we have. God, would you enable us to speak your word with great boldness? God, would you enable us to speak the truth, but do it in a way of love? God, would you help us to have courage and not be afraid to share our faith with those? There are people today that are that are so fearful because they don't have a relationship with you. They don't know what's going to happen when they die from this earth. They really don't know. And God, you have placed us here at this time to be your ambassadors. We are your hands and your feet. God, I pray that you would give us the boldness to do that. Lord, I pray that you would keep us safe so that we can be used for your glory. But God, if you choose that during this time in our service for you, that we would we would not make it to the next generation, then so be it. As long as our efforts are for you and for you alone, that you would get the glory and not a church, not a man, not anybody. God, give us wisdom. But God, let us be about your business in such a way that when people talk about us, they will know that we belong to you. Help us, God. Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray for our nation's leaders to have wisdom. God, we pray that they would have courage. God, that they would turn to you like never before. Lord, even those that may seem like they, they reject you and they hate you, God, in the quietness of their own homes and their own minds and souls, God, speak to them. Holy Spirit, visit each and every member of our government. Let them know that you are real that You love them. And God, we still have an opportunity to humble ourselves, to turn from our wicked ways, to seek You with all that we have. And God, when we do that, You promise that You will hear from heaven, forgive us of our sin, and God, You would heal our land. I pray that You would do that today. Now, today, as we go to wherever we have to go, whether we have to go to a grocery store or whether we just go home. But God, as we get on social media or use our phones or whatever tools that You have given us, God, that we would just tell people of the love of Jesus Christ and how they can be saved and set free from the life of sin. Thank You, Lord, for being with us today. Give this church wisdom as we go forward. Not even sure what we're going to be able to do in the next week. God, we know You're our provider. We thank You for being always faithful. You have never let us down and You never will. We love You and we honor You today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.